appropriate recommendation for moving forward. Um, let me show you the Buffalo watershed. This is to show you that there's a number of monitoring points, not only on these tributaries, but on the Buffalo River itself. So we have a huge set of data, and Julie has a handout that speaks to this. But um, I just wanted to point this out. The hog farm, if, since this is kind of the elephant in the room, um, sits somewhere on that, I guess it might be fair to call it, light blue line where you see the, the name BC6 and BC7 as the first, and I, I don't have a pointer, but um, hopefully you can see that. It's the, the southernmost point on that tributary that's light blue. And then BC7, the hog farm sits off to the right of that. And the farm is there as well as the fields, which um, waste is applied to. BC6 is a specific point that was selected by the U of A in their uh, agriculture department in their study to look at upgradient conditions before there might be influence from the hog farm. BC7 is to pick up immediate downgradient impacts. The remainder of the monitors existed before that study, so we have a lot larger universe of data for those points. The BUFTO6, or the Park Service data point, is right at the confluence of the Big Creek and the Buffalo River. We have uh, a lot more historical data on that, and we, of course, it's further down, down flow, if you will, of the stream, and then, of course, stream, we have data across the Buffalo, both upgradient of that entry of that stream as well as down down the river itself. So we wanted you to, and we have a lot of history. Arkansas happens to be a state that monitors our streams robustly. Um, we probably have one of the most significant uh, historical data sets, and that's largely due to the quality of watersheds that we have. And we, as a state, we felt like it's important to, to keep a uh, in many cases, monthly data sets on these streams. So we do have a lot of knowledge on the Buffalo River. We do not have any information on Big Creek, though any further upstream of this BC6 data point. So what you see is we're only looking at, when we look at the BC6 to BC7 uh, re segment, if you will, of that stream, it only represents about a third of what we would call the reach that we would normally monitor. So a reach would start where the stream starts, which is further down at the black line, and it would go all the way up to that BC7 point. So what does this really show? I, I felt like it's important to summarize because I went through a lot of technical details. But um, where we are is we're completing our final analysis. April 1st is coming soon. Arkansas has been very uh, determined to always meet the April 1st requirement in law. However, other states tend to take longer in their assessment. We hope that we can achieve that this year because of the level of comments and attention this has had. We are considering whether a, a, a week or two additional time to make sure our responses to comments are appropriate or completed, but we are currently targeting an April 1st or at least no later than April 15th submittal this year. EPA has 30 days to act on our list. At this point, they have been holding a list that we've submitted since 2008 um, for a lot of reasons, but um, at this point, uh, we understand that they are interested in getting this list before they make any decisions regarding any list that they currently have in front of them. Second point we need to make is Buffalo River is definitely free of impairment. There's been no debate about that. It continues to be a pristine water body and definitely an attraction for both tourism and for the a use to the landowners. Standards that were established for the tributaries are providing adequate protection for the Buffalo River and uses. So we see different standards actually applied to the tributaries than the actual Buffalo River. They're a little less stringent because they are not designated as ERWs or Extraordinary Resource Water Body, but we find that those standards are in fact protecting the Buffalo River and its uses. We do believe it's prudent to continue evaluations and potentially expand the studies based on the data that's been submitted to us on tributaries. And we do believe it's also prudent to act in a collaborative manner to maintain water quality, not only in the Buffalo River itself, but in its tributaries. And therefore, we hope to take the data we have and evaluate it through sound science. And we believe that is critical as we inform effective regulatory approaches that might come down the road. 
So I think that was kind of where I wanted to summarize. Julie, did you want to uh, speak kind of on your handout briefly? So I am not an engineer, and I have a background much like y'all's. So I made a cheat sheet to sort of consolidate this information. And with your indulgence, I'll go over some of, I think, the more controversial points and where maybe as you all are engaged with your constituents in conversations about this issue particularly, you're going to be comparing apples to apples. So as I go through the sheet, I'm going to highlight to you where perhaps our view of the data and the National Park Service data may diverge. So I'm going to give you the heads up along the way and some, I think, pretty um, big highlights in this data. Feel free to interrupt me. I'm going to go into my professor mode and I will take questions um, intermittently. First of all, the, the due date. Um, you know, people are asking, well, why do you turn it in April 1st? EPA, they, never, they, they have 30 days after we turn it in to approve it. Um, they're quite far behind in the approval process. So they're saying, the EPA doesn't turn it in, why do you turn it in? We want to have clean hands in this. Arkansas is one of the best. We've always complied with the April 1st deadline. We had every intention to do it this time. Um, a, a lackadaisical approach by the EPA, in my opinion, does not warrant, and in my director's opinion, more importantly, does not warrant us dragging our feet. So we have every intention to do as we've always done and submit this by April 1st regardless of the EPA's response. So the due date period, that's important. Number two, the period of record. When people are talking to you all about the science, the, the data gathered, for this report that is due, we can only consider data for Category 5 listing purposes. That's, that's the nuclear weapon, right? That's a very bad thing to be a Category 5. They want to be as fair as possible. So they're very specific. Only data, 2010, April 1st, 2010, till March 31st, 2015. So when you hear constituents or people say, oh, what about this data, what about this data? That's your next important question. What, what is the date of the data? Next, category rankings. As you're gonna hear, the big controversy is whether these three tributaries are listed as category three or category five. Most of our comments have said, hey, you proposed listing them at category three, they, we think they should be category five. Nobody's talking about category one, nobody's talking about category two, and no one's talking about category four. Category four is a neat category. If we don't get this problem moving in the right direction, it's something we're gonna to have to consider as a possibility. Something to avoid category five, which in my opinion, Arkansas is best um, able to handle Arkansas's problems. You wanna avoid the federal government taking control of your problem. So category five provides you or no options. Category four provides you an option to come up with a state plan to fix. But category three in, in, in our preliminary review, and again, as Director Keogh stated, we're going back, checking our math twice, but our preliminary review states that these three tributaries should be listed as category three based on the data that we've received, the time period of that data, and the results of that data. I'm gonna show you as I go along, the data that we can't consider outside of the 2015 period after March 31st, the numbers are getting better. So what we don't wanna do is spend a lot of resources fixing a problem that does not exist. It may be that 2014 was just a freaky year. Weird things happen. That's why you have to look at three seasons and two years of data because you have to account for statistical anomalies. So as I go through that, we're gonna even look at information that we can't look at, but it, it may give y'all more insight into where we are in this position. So different categories to choose from. The standards, there are four standards that we look at. Number one, you look at whether or not the, the resource, resource, the water body, is an extraordinary resource water. I will tell you, the Park Service considers uses applies the extraordinary resource water standard to the tributaries. It is our opinion as an agency, mine as a lawyer, hers as a director, that is not the correct standard to, to be applied for, th for this purpose. It's a wonderful aspirational standard, but particularly our rules, if you'll notice on the first page, Spring River, including its tributaries, and it lists them, right? What does it say when it gets to the Buffalo River? It does not say including its tributaries. It is our position, if the tributaries were to be considered exceptional resource waters, 
and have that heightened standard to be applied, it would say so. It does not. So that's the next important takeaway, I think, from this. What standard are you applying? The Buffalo River standard or the tributary standard? And, and that, is, that is the fine line between our data and the National Park Service. So that's an important question to ask. So now the actual standards. And you can see the differences. And you can see how we may have the very same data but come to different conclusions with that one piece of information. The ERW, I apologize if you don't like uh, acronyms, Mr. Chairman, um, 298 colonies per 100 milliliters, secondary season. And I've gone on, maybe I skipped over the, it matters too on the season. So the primary season is May 1st through September 30th, secondary season October 1st through April 30th. Obviously, the logic is clear. There are more people in the water. You've got a heightened standard. So that, that's how the primary, secondary seasons are defined, and then those are the numbers. Now, now the fun part, the math. 25%, if you look at your sampling, if 25% of your sampling exceed these standards, it goes on the list. However, if you look at my, my cheat sheet of the math here, we've got Bear Creek. We, we already know the buffalo is great. Let's, let's just like get the great story at the end. The buffalo bacteria level is 16.6% below the extraordinary resource water standard. It is at 0.8.4%. It is an excellent shape. That is, if you can leave here with one thing, it, that is the number one thing to know. The Buffalo River is in excellent shape. And the samplings, out of, on, on the, arriving at this 8.4%, the primary 119 samples, only 10 exceeded. And five of those exceeding were overlapping days. Two samples taken on the same day, and, or one taken at a different point. A lot of things can account for that, right? What, what happened at that exact point? Could be a cow walk by, could be a rain event. So we, don't, we only have five. That's a very low number. We're not even close to the 25%. The buffalo is fine. Okay, the Park Service has data. However, their lab was not certified until March of 2016. For Category 5 listing, because it is such a big deal, you can only use data from a certified lab. So. I have some notes in the, the very last page and where, where it says some of the data is outside the record. It's because we only use, for Category 5 consideration purposes, National Park Service data after the time for which they became a certified lab. That's the next question you need to ask when people talk about it. Is this before you were a certified lab or after? Are you a certified lab? Are you, are you meeting on with a bucket? I mean, what, find your source. It has to be a certified lab. We are so thankful the National Park Service is now a certified lab. We're going to get more and more data that we can use. But we're not going to change the rules because they weren't and they are now. March 2016 forward is the point for, the, for that to be in Category 5. Now certainly we want to look at everything we can when we're looking at a Category 3 listing. Okay, so I went ahead and broke down some of this data for you. Hopefully your eyes won't gloss over too much, but we've already gone through the Buffalo River. I think this is your number one takeaway, tell you everything you know. But if you have tributaries in your district or you're hearing from people, a, a few, if you'll indulge me, just a little bit now. Um, Bear Creek, not even close. Again, 8.3%. 8, 8 Remember, the magic number is 25%. Again, this is applying the regular standard, not the extraordinary resource water standard. Mill Creek, not even close, but we have a little bit. And if you look at the dates, we're, we're considering that. Something to think about. Chairman? Yes, Representative Page. I thought maybe I was the only one that didn't have it, but as I look around, we've got a bunch of us without the handout. I'm wondering if we could have staff give us the handout, because I don't think anybody on this side of the room has the handouts. There, there are two. There's a two-page and one-page. This is on the one page we're talking about. Ms. Kendrick, do you have the... I think we have that one. That I, I see oh, one page. Page. So there's two different things. One is two pages, and it starts with three and three. List information. Okay. 
they're getting those out. Thank you, Representative Pitt, for bringing that up. Okay. So Bear Creek, Mill Creek. Now, this, this is the sexy part, if there is such a thing. So Big Creek reached 20. This is the, if, if you remember the map she showed before, this is the little section closest to the buffalo, the, the nearest. So you can imagine the, the, whatever the pollutant, like you've got more and more and more time before you, get, you hit, hit the main flow. So reach 20, 99 samples, 11 exceed, we're at 11%. It, it's not great. But it's not 25%. We're not even. We're not even close. We're not even halfway. Secondary, 0.2%. Now reach 22, the hot spot, right? Where CNH Hog Farm is located. 50 samples, 13 exceeding, 26%. If these exceedances were not in a single year, man, we we got a little bit of a problem, right? And, and I say that very carefully. A little bit of a problem. 25 is the magic number, it's 26. So if you're one over, oh my gosh, the hog farm has changed everything. If you look at the data a little bit more, you find that isn't exactly the case, is it? Because there are almost as many upstream from the hog farm as downstream. And they, the dates parallel. So what we're finding is probably where we're not measuring. Far upstream, there, there was a problem in 2014. But the data does not support that CNH hog farm, the, like the upstream downstream hits would look differently if this were what people are saying it is. So y'all need to be informed. We're, we're getting great data from the University of Arkansas study. We'll continue to look at that data. But right now, this data is, is showing us there is, there is an E. coli issue, at least there was in 2014, in this tributary. From where it comes, we don't know, and we're probably not measuring or are unable to measure the point source. Maybe the creek has run dry, maybe it's right there, but no significant difference at that point. I think that's an important thing for you all to know. Now, the next two, where I told you, we could look at lab data before and after certification. I want to just give you a view of the future. So this means nothing for our report, for our technical report. But REACH 22, and if you'll remember, that's the CNH Hog Farm REACH, for 2014 data, 30.2, 43 samples, 13 hits. But 2015, 46 samples, 4 hits. We're down to 8.7. So maybe 2014 was just a weird year. The 20 reach, the, the money reach, the one that is actually touches the river, 11, and then it goes down to 5.2 in 2015. So it's our position that very firmly these tributaries belong on the watch list. We need more information. We need more data. We're going to look at these. We're going we're gonna to see if 2014 was a weird year. And that's why these protocols are, are set up. And we, we're looking at them using the standards that our rules indicate that we use. Not exceptional water standards, but tributary standards. The buffalo is fine. And these numbers are, at least in my opinion, as an Arkansan who spends a lot of time on the buffalo, looking, looking promising. So the, the numbers are going down. And um, we have a lot of ideas of what we can do short of a five listing. There, uh, we, need, we need to watch this stuff. We need to pay attention. But um, if you have any other questions, for me, uh, again, I'm not a scientist. I'm an attorney. But this was very helpful for me to look at just how to talk or think my way through it. But she, she's the smart one, so ask her the hard questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Armstrong, did you have a question, sir? Yeah, yes, sir. Basically, when did the hog farm go in? What year? Uh, well, the, the study on the hog farm started in 2013. I'll have to ask you. It's, it's around 2013, I think. 2012 is when it actually started operations. The U of A study began late. It became at the end of what we call our primary season. So the first sampling taken on this big creek was in late 2013. It was like in September. It caught the very end of that primary contact season. Therefore, we don't have two years of data um, um, under the period of record. We would need a full 2013 and 2014, we believe, to do a Category 5 listing at this time. That, that's to her point and to our assessment methodology. 
um, even though we see this, we saw this bump up, if you will, or too much bacteria in the spring of 2014, um, we don't believe it rises to the level of listing at this point, although others may interpret it differently. That's what our assessment methodology says. Um, and then lastly, um, we would look at 2015 going forward on an action plan that we talked about. Could it, could it, could it probably, could the E. coli rate probably come from some other contaminants other than the hog farm? I'm just trying to find out because Absolutely. I read a lot about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you could have had something happening upstream or downstream that could have caused that, like an algae problem or something like that could have caused the same problem in there. Right. E. coli is a bacteria. It can come from various, uh, it can come from someone being in the stream. It can be, come from various animals. It can come from a domestic sewage line that, or a septic tank that perks over. You know, at one point in time, sample can, you know, basically really cause some, a, a hit on these streams. So I think these scientists that are going to speak after me have a lot better information on that and can give you that perspective better than I can. But but E. coli is coming down constantly each year. We have it, it is in 2015. We saw what, what we saw was we saw we don't have data at these points in the stream before 2013. The 2013 data was late in the season. We didn't see any elevated levels in 2013. 2014 we saw those seven six upstream, seven downstream, if you will. The samples taken on the same day, and then. Um, you know, 2015, we're down to, what, two samples up and two down, or, or a total of four samples were exceeded. So these are very small data sets when you consider a five-month review period on a primary season. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Bragg, did you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there various strains or variations of E. coli? There, there are different, um, well, again, I prefer that you ask the ag engineering professor about to come up here. Yes, there are different forms of bacteria. There's different sources, and actually there's analytical methodology to look at the E. coli sample and trace it to the type of source that might be contributing, and that is actually what some um, states, uh, for instance, where a TMDL was done in Oklahoma, they did that source testing on the E. coli sample where it, and they look to see if it was from human or from cow or from, you know, different sources. That's a verb. You know, we had one, there was one stream in the country that was exceeded E. coli, and it turned out it had nothing to do with that, but it was birds depositing in the stream due to bird deposition. So, you know, it's very important to understand that, and that's, again, why Category 3 is a very valuable tool for the agency to be able to go work with U of A to get that data. And we think that is where we could potentially expand our data set. We have to be careful because those data, that data is very expensive, and we need to make sure that we only, you know, we do use it sparingly because you can't just go out. I mean, it could cost us over $100,000 if we wanted to do this on every sample. We don't think that's for the use of tax dollars. Okay, that's kind of what I was wondering. You might not know specifically the source, but you could identify it different. We can start doing some testing, at least on a pilot level, and I think we've talked to some of the professors at U of A about that possibility in the future year study. Thank you. Representative Hillman, you had a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Perhaps more than one. Uh, those of you who know me, I know now. Uh, I've hammered for years on unnecessary government regulations. And the questions that I want to ask today, I need to understand as a farmer and as a legislator, so I like yeses and noes. Is there a procedure by which you list these streams in different categories? Yes. Have you followed those directions in what you're trying to do today? Yes. Then why are we here? <laughs> Oh, well, I can't give you an answer in this scenario, but I can tell you that we believe there's been that comment, I said, a lot of rhetoric, and we felt like it was important to bring to you the reality as you go back to your districts, especially those of you that are in agricultural areas, because it, it is a broader discussion than the Buffalo River. I think people need to understand what this data means and what it means ultimately in terms of protecting and preserving. I mean, we're all about making and preserving our water quality in Arkansas because that is 
a precious resource for us. So I think we have to be careful to make sure everyone understands how we use data and, uh, and not jump quickly to regulation that we do it in an informed way. I, th I, think, I think we all want to protect. What I want to protect against is overprotection mm -hmm. so that we don't have that resource available to us in the future. Uh, I've been from one end of the Buffalo to the other, and I love that river. And I'm glad that it's there for our use, and I want to protect it. But still, when I float by those farms and everything that were taken away from the private landowners back in the 70s, I have to feel uh, somewhat of a sorrow for them because their families, they did not get the opportunity to pass that on to their families. And they were good stewards of this land just like we are. So I, I, I am in favor of us doing what is necessary to protect our streams, but we do not need to overprotect them, Mr. Chapman. So I support what y'all are doing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It might be important to note that we have three rivers that we're recommending come off the Category 5 list as a result of an Arkansas strategy working through the Natural Resources Agency to do uh, what we call a collaborative approach. So we've shown that that can be successful in Arkansas. We think that's important to point out to, to the committee. Well, that's good, and I'm sure Mr. Young will appreciate that also. Uh, Mr. Pitch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with Representative Hillman, but to me, I want to be clear, it looks like we're only facing one hotspot of data I want to try and get some clarification because Reach 20 didn't generate anything of concern. Reach 22, and maybe this is the engineer in me, but it shows 26%, 13 hits on 50. Below, we show Reach 22 with 13 hits on 43. Did we exclude those seven downstream hits is why it went to 43? Am I looking at that right? Now, I think you're seeing the 50 included the 2013 and 2014 data set, and the 43 was just strictly, if I'm correct, um, the 2014 data set. So we, we typically look at the full re data record. Like, so we had data in 2013. We had no hits. but was it So the 50 includes two years' worth of hits. I guess what I'm trying to say is the 26% mathematical certainty has got to be a testing thing, and I agree, and I want to make sure that that's what we're doing. But I question why we went 13 out of 43 in the bottom read out of 2014 versus the top. Well, that is exactly we had we had six I think if I can do my math or seven samples that were taken in 2013 that had no exceedances okay. in 2013. Cool. So the data set she referenced where it says 50 samples included those seven samples that had no exceedances plus the 43 samples where we saw the. 13 exceedances, so does that make sense? It, it does, and I guess my concern, I'm like Representative Hillman, I don't want to over-regulate something based especially on a 1% and a half. You know, it appears to me 99 is a good sample. Other years, and we've got half a sample here. Yeah, remember, this okay. is a data set for, it was set up to not, this was not a typical data set. This was supposed to be a data set for this data set was very focused data set, and we're now using that data to look at the reach, if you will. And so I think we have to be careful to know that that data set is designed to evaluate a specific activity on that segment, not the entire reach, if you will, of what could be added into the script. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative McElroy, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, when you had the elevated level, uh, was it in two, 2014? 2014. Uh, it was upstream. The, the samples upstream were elevated as well? That's correct. I think there were six upstream and seven down. And, and the U of A professor is prepared to show you that data. It also varies depending on whether you have what we call base flow, meaning a normal condition or immediately after a storm event. Okay, so he's going to describe that a little bit. Well, I'm an old rice farmer and I try to make water run up here and it just don't do it. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? Go ahead. 